Rajal Ikrimi, you look at the part pictures and then you sum it up to get the big picture, and that's false, that's not the correct picture of reality. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Billahi min ash-shaytan al-jim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Rabbi Zidni Ilma Allah min yasabak ilman nafiyah So we are here to seek knowledge Knowledge is a very powerful thing one of the greatest gifts of Allah but it has to be sought with the correct purpose and you have to seek the right kind of knowledge some types of knowledge like the angels Harut and Marut came and they were giving wrong types of knowledge and they were telling people that this is harmful for you but we are here as a test and a trial so people did not listen and they acquired the wrong type of knowledge and they did harm to themselves and to others so knowledge is very powerful it can cause damage and it can cause good so there are many things which uh, if we have the bad intentions like if we want to become popular if we want to become famous if we want to be able to argue with others and defeat them in the argument, then these are purposes for which seeking knowledge is haram, not permitted. And if you seek knowledge with these purposes, you will cause damage to yourself and to others. So why do, why do we seek knowledge? We seek knowledge not to, uh, to serve humanity. And we seek it because it is the order of Allah. Allah Ta'ala asks us to seek knowledge, so we seek knowledge and we seek it for this with the spirit of service so now um, uh, there were two axioms we were discussing that are starting the the classical theory and also new classical theory is based on exactly the same axioms one is that the firms hire labor up till the marginal product equals the real wage. And the second is that the laborers set the real wage equal to the marginal disability of labor. So after you reject the second axiom, because he found that these were not compatible with observations about the reality, so he said that, well, wage negotiations are about nominal wages, not real wages. Real wage is an emergent property, which means it comes from the system. It doesn't come from uh, analyzing the behavior of small subunits. And when you have something going on in nominal wages, then it means that money is an important variable because change the level of money and it might change the prices, but it also changes the nominal wages. So uh, uh, money will have an effect, a real effect on the economy. So money is not neutral. And Keynes says this specifically, money is not neutral in the short run or in the long run. Still, you see, all of the things that Keynes said have been, yani some of them were never understood and some of them were understood and rejected. So basically, what Keynes was trying to do is no longer, yani, is not understood in any of the models that you study today. So what is the evidence against cl classical theory? Well, there is some observational evidence which we will discuss later in detail. What um, Keynes said about the blindness of the classical economists, this is the thing that I would like to discuss first. And he says that basically, you see, all of classical economic theory applies to the case of full employment because it is assumed there that but if uh, full employment doesn't hold, then the theory doesn't apply. And full employment doesn't hold because we see it in the real world. So he says that the classical theorists are like Euclidean geometries. The Euclidean geometry has the parallel postulates, which says that uh, if a line is parallel, then it cannot meet the other line. He says that well, there are two types of non-Euclidean geometries that have been discovered, one in which you have multiple non-parallel uh, non lines and the other one in which there are no parallel lines, all lines intersect. So, um, so if you have the axioms built inside your head and you just cannot ignore them, then if you see two lines, then you um, tell the lines that don't behave so badly. Uh, 
And this is exactly what is happening today. This is what economic theory of today is about. That you you scold the global financial. Why did you happen? You're not supposed to happen. Instead, of, my theory says that people are rational. So instead of changing the theory, you you abuse the facts. So this is what Keynes said about the blindness of economists at that time, and the same blindness all today. And economists have been blind to what Keynes said. So. Keynes uh, created a new model, and we will try to recreate that model because nobody knows that model. The ISLM model is a misinterpretation of Keynes, and uh, many people wrote many books on understanding Keynes. I have a whole book which has seven different essays about seven different people having seven different theories about what Keynes said, but none of them are right. But the basic thing that is very important for you to understand is that. What Keynes was trying to do was to create a model which explains the observed reality, and the reason that people cannot understand Keynes is because they have fixed ideas that the parallel postulate holds. The, he, they say that okay, we assume that the laborers will set the marginal disability equal to real wages. Now let us try to understand Keynes. Now it becomes impossible because you have said that uh, this is this must be true, and so. uh whatever you try to do you can't understand him because the first thing you have to do is to give away this axiom and then you can start thinking so what are models this is what i would like to teach to you to understand what models are and strangely enough economists don't understand and you have been told the wrong understanding so if we can understand today what models are then you will be a uh, one step ahead of Uh, all of your fellow economic students throughout the world so what are models are not mathematical equations models are ideas about how this world behaves so for example how do consumers behave do we have an idea about that it's not going to be an equation it's not utility maximization it's about your experience of the world how do consumers you have a lot of experience you have you are a consumer yourself you have seen your mother and father and you have seen hundreds of people doing shopping so you know a lot of things so your theory must match what you see it must try to explain mm -hmm. now the theories you have been taught have no relation to what you have seen that's why you are confused when you read these theories and because you have not been told that models are supposed to match reality then you don't understand that there is a contradiction between what you are learning and what you see and your what you see is primary this is what keynes is trying to tell the economists that what we observe that is the first thing theory is the second thing but the economist believe in the opposite they say theory comes first experience if it matches good if it doesn't match ignore it so models are ideas and one more important thing about models is that they talk about the hidden forces which behind drive behavior so models are about unobservable things this is one this is the reason why economists got caught because in the west the misunderstanding emerged that science is about observables and not about unobservables so this is why for example the theory of revealed preference you see preference is a feeling of the heart that i like this and i and everybody knows but according to the economists misunderstanding of science the um uh science is about observable so if you talk about preferences you are not talking science because that's in the heart so what did samuelson do he said that okay um how does this preference express itself in the observable reality so if i give you a choice between a apple and a banana and you like bananas then you will choose the apple so that's revealed preference because now we can observe that i gave her a choice and she took the banana so she likes bananas now this is the samuelson's theory but what i would like for you to understand is that samuelson's theory of revealed preference is wrong and this is a mistake and it is a childish mistake and the reason that these people make uh, these yani nobel prize winner makes childish mistakes is because they have this aqida this strong faith in this uh, science that it has observable so now why is this um revealed preference theory for which samuelson got the nobel prize 
And the Nobel Prize states that Samuelson got the Nobel Prize because he made economics a science. Because before uh, Samuelson, economics depended on these feelings of the heart, these utilities, these, uh, these uh, preferences that we have that I, I get pleasure from consuming something. But now this is something that is unobservable. So it can't be science. So when you reduce it to choice, it becomes a science. But the problem is that revealed preference cannot be understood without the feeling of the heart. You see, if uh, Uzma likes bananas, then every time I give her apples and bananas, she will choose the banana. But if there is no feeling in the heart, suppose that you are a Buddhist and you have become completely indifferent to all the things in the world, then whatever choice I give you, you will choose at random because all things are the same for you. So, the, the fact that preferences should be tra uh, transitive, they should uh, satisfy certain properties, this comes because of the heart. If the heart is not there, then preferences will not have any properties. So this is a, a fallacy, uh, 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 an error. And actually people have pointed out this error of Sam Wilson. So, uh, Nobel Prize winners make childish mistakes because they don't understand the nature of science. So one important insight is that because models are hypotheses about unobservables, what is inside the heart? So nobody can actually open up the heart and see what is inside. We can make guesses about it and we can never be 100% sure. So this was one another source for the reason that the West made the mistake because they uh, assumed, again, aqidah, that science is always leads to certainty. So, if I start talking about guesses about unobservables, as I said, this is what science is. Science is about making a good guess and we hope that it's right. We can never be sure. So, this is the, this is the reality, but uh, because this correct understanding leads to the res uh, res result that science must be uncertain, they could not accept this. So, they said, no, science has to be true and the only way it can be true is if you start with axioms which are certain and use logic which is perfect and then you reach conclusions which are 100% true regardless of what the reality is like the Pythagorean theorem it is true regardless of how you draw the triangle so uh, this idea, this wrong idea about what science should be misled them about uh, how to do science and this is the mistake that we are living with. This is the mistake that is called economic theory today. So science does not lead to uncertain. It does not lead to certainty. It's just a guess about the real world, and we know how to make these guesses. And that's what I. And so once you start making it, this was exactly what Ibn al Haytham did. He replaced the search for certainty by making good guesses about what things are like without uh, without having certainty. And this is what started science and this is what science is today. It's about making good guesses about the nature of unobserved reality. But, um, okay. So there are two major axioms, part of the uh, um, aqidah of the West, that science leads to certainty and truth and there is nothing else which can lead to certainty and truth. Both of these are wrong. And then science is concerned with appearances, not with reality and that's also wrong. So these wrong ideas prevent the West, especially in economics, from understanding the nature of science and understanding economics and understanding how to develop good economic theories. So this is a very important diagram. Uh, they, uh, I will discuss some philosophy but I will explain what uh, huge numbers. It took me years and years to understand because there are volumes and volumes of books with very complicated and convoluted language trying to explain things that a baby can understand if it is said correctly. So here is the basic thing. There is reality which is called noumena. Uh, then there are the appearances which are the phenomena. So the reality is underneath like Allah Ta'ala, angels, all the hidden system of the world. And then there is the phenomena which those are the things we can see. And then there is our mind. Inside our mind we have models of reality. We, we have some idea 
It may be Allah Ta'ala is there, maybe he is not, maybe some other things are. So we have some ideas in our mind about what is the reality. So basically then the main issue is how well is our model of reality which is in our mind matched to the true reality. If we have a good match, then we have a good model. If we, our uh, mental model, the theory, the economic theory, for example, utility theory, you see there's utility theory. Utility theory says this is how consumers behave. They maximize utilities. Then there's the reality, how com consumers really behave. So we say that consumers have a utility function which they maximize. Now, is this in the heart of the consumer? Well, I am a consumer, I know, I have never, uh, I, I don't know anything about utility functions. I, this is not how I think when I go to the market, I don't maximize anything, I don't have a budget constraint, I have just money in my pocket. Or actually I take the money according to what I am planning to buy. So, uh, the total income that I have for the month does not really pay, play any part in my decisions about what I am going to buy. So, it's clear. From our experience we know we can reject this model right away and if you understand the correct methodology you will, okay this model is no go, just get rid of it. But what do the economists do? The economists say that, well, economists and uh, western scientists made three mistakes in understanding science. Basically they cut out the reality and uh, I will explain how this happened. So. They said, okay, we have no access. This is a very powerful argument which Kant, the big philosopher, made and many others. That, you see, we have no access to reality. All I can see is what I can see. These are The phenomena is everything that I can see. Everything observable is the phenomena. What lies underneath the phenomena, I can never see. Exactly as I can never see what is in your heart. So it means that we have no access, so we must not talk about that. Now that's ridiculous. There are lots of things that I cannot observe, but I can still have knowledge. So this is the basic and most fundamental, most important mistake which continues to this day. That I can have no knowledge about something which is unobservable. Now, I know... Uh, how my mother feels about me even though I cannot cut her heart open and see what is inside it. Now, so I have knowledge and, and ultimately I don't know. I mean, I, I think I know but I may be wrong. Similarly, I know how my students feel about me to some extent. But um, I may be wrong about that too. So, the idea that we must put that aside, get rid of that, because that's unobserved. That's a wrong idea because we have to make guesses. We cannot uh, proceed even though I know nothing. I can never open the heart of the person who is sitting and having a conversation with me. All the time I am guessing as to whether he is understanding what I am saying or not and acting according to these guesses because this is what life is about. So, uh, all the time we are dealing with unobservables and we are making guesses and we are acting on the basis of these guesses. So all the time we are acting on uncertain knowledge. Now one of the most fundamental, any the, the mainstream dominant definition of Western knowledge uh, as defined in the West is that it is a justified true belief. So if the belief is justified, if I think something about you, uh, it has to be true if it is to be classified as knowledge. If I cannot tell whether it's true or false, then it's not knowledge. So, 99.9% .9 of what I know is not knowledge. So, it means that I can't live in, a, uh, in normal uh, life. I eat food and I know that it's not poisoned. Even though I have no proof, I have no justification, I have no evidence, I cannot, but I, I just assume this, this is my knowledge. If I knew it was poisoned, then I wouldn't eat it. So, so, they never understood, they, they got the science from uh, the East, but they never understood what science was. And so, there are, uh, there is this book, 
currently uh, i forgot the name of the author but it is a very popular textbook called what is this thing called science and it has a huge number of controversies there is this philosopher i and hacking about and he has 14 different theories about what science is so nobody understood what science is because they start with this aqida that science must be certain and true so uh, i want to go through some of this uh, idea because all of us have absorbed this these wrong ideas about science and they are preventing us from uh, doing uh, uh, good research understanding what theories are understanding what models are understanding how to make a good model all of these things we will learn inshallah in this course so it starts with all the way back with plato and plato's has ideal forms these are abstract perfections like the perfect circle which only exists in the ideal world which is called alimul masal by our philosophers forms like consider the color red now the color red it doesn't exist in this real world in the sense that you can find instances that shirt is a little bit red that one is a little bit red and you can find variation but the abstraction the color itself it doesn't exist in the real world it's only an idea so there are certain perfect forms and they exist and this is the highest truth so now this um, this is a misunderstanding of uh, the nature of reality which i will explain in a little while but basically what it caused was you see ptolemy had this idea that the circle is the perfect form and so the stars are which are perfect things they must follow the perfect orbit so they must follow circular orbits now the observation shows that it is not so okay but we can't give up the uh, the aqida so we say that okay we instead of uh, so we fit cer- another circle so instead of following one circle you follow two circles and you follow a circle upon a circle still doesn't fit because actually it's an ellipse so uh, they introduced third circles and they kept making it more and more complicated but they couldn't give up the circle the aqida because that's perfection that comes from the uh, alam al misal that has to be true it's just like the economist the utility maximization is just perfection it's the beauty of mathematics it uh, takes precedence over the truth okay now uh um, going back to this picture you see what happened is that the reality there was almost universal agree- agreement that this part doesn't play any role because we can have no access to it so you should ignore that so then basically there is the phenomena and then there is the models and all of the discussion is about the phenomena and the models and confusions about what which is the phenomena and which is the model but no discussion of reality so there is bacon and so once the uh, ibn al hasan's theories and uh, islamic scientific theories came into the west for the first time you see uh, aristotle said that uh, you don't have to do any experimentation and uh, you don't have to make any observations and plato said that you know truth is in the ideal world of forms so you don't need to look at the world so for the first time islamic methods about experimentation observation came and then they is trying to figure out how can we learn about the world by observation and by experimentation so the first person who made some understanding of this was bacon francis bacon and he is no, known as the father of science even though he never understood the first thing about science so uh basically what bacon was doing was that he was looking at the phenomena he says how can we look at phenomena so induction is basically about looking for a pattern within the phenomena not about reality it's about observations so he understood that you see the the uh, plato was about the model only the right hand circle what is in the mind uh he was studying in the mind and bacon said he let's go to the phenomena neither of them went to the reality and so bacon became known as the father of science at the same time 
Descartes came along and he also uh, he, he worked more on the model side and he said that the how can we develop these models. So what his contribution was that he said that we need to articulate the model. So basically mathematical models come from looking at the model. So uh, start by doubting of everything, search for certainty. So this is basically the start of the axiomatic method that you start, the models should start by taking axioms and then you derive so uh, results from that. So basically then uh, there are two types of truths. There are truths about the models. These are called analytic truths. So I start with axioms. I start with the Euclidean geometry and I make some postulates and then I prove the Pythagorean theorem. That's an analytic truth. And there, then there are synthetic truths. These are the Bacon side of the picture that you look at all of the ducks, all of the swans in Europe and they are all white. So when the philosophy got started, they said, look, all swans are white. This is an example of an empirical truth, which is called a synthetic truth. So, these are the two types of truths, and there was some uh, there was some debate and as to which of these two theories is right. So, logical positivists in the 20th century they came up with a resolution. They said both of these things are true. So, we have synthetic truths and we have analytic truths. But uh, again, no touch with reality. So, all of this is completely wrong. So, um, this is, I mean, for centuries they have been trying to understand science <laughs> without success. So, uh, one more thing the, about the synthetic truth is that the, the, I, the, when they went to Australia they found black swans. So then this is the famous black swan because the empirical truth, this is the problem with induction. If you look at uh, a pattern and you say, okay, this pattern holds, how do you know if it is true? This is exactly the mistake and fallacy of regression models. They look for a pattern in the past data and then they say, okay, this pattern will continue. How do you know? You don't. Induction as a principle is a wrong idea about how science works. And on this wrong idea, all of econometrics is built, which means that all of econometrics that you study is wrong. So, uh, what Hume understood, he was one of the first of the secular philosophers, is that there are some real concepts to which you cannot get. Causality is one of them. Causality is very interesting. He, what Hume says is that what we can observe is that event A happened first and then event B happened next. This is exactly Granger causality. One thing follows another. Now, causation is more than uh, that. It, it says that this must happen. So, for example, if people say that, okay, when it rains, we, we observe rain and then we observe people going around with um, umbrellas. So it follows that rains cause people to wear umbrellas. Well, this is not true in the strict sense of causation. Rains cause people to think, then people might or might not use umbrellas. But according to Granger causality, this is completely true. This is, this is all that you can say. So causality is about actually things which, that it's, it's a necessary truth that Whenever rain happens, then uh, uh, the uh, the other uh, event will happen. So one thing, uh, yani it's about uh, imaginary worlds, what might happen. Probability is also about imaginary worlds. And that's why probability was never understood in the West to, to, well, uh, in the West to this day. Uh, because probability is about what happens when you flip a coin. Now it came up heads, but it could have come up heads. It could have come up tails. This is again uh, an imaginary world, an unobservable reality. So, once you rule out unobservable realities, you cannot understand probability. So, um, uh, all of their major uh, philosophers uh, said that we cannot get to the reality 
So ultimately causality was forgotten, even though causality is very important. You see, if you run a regression of uh, GDP growth on number of newspapers per capita, you find a very strong correlation. You find uh, high R squared, significant T statistics. If you run a regression of GDP growth on um, education, expenditure in education 10 years before, then you find a low correlation. But now this second relationship is a causal relationship. If you invest in education 10 years from now, you will get returns in growth. The first one is not, but econometrics has no way of telling. So according to the econometrics, uh, if we just start publishing more newspapers, we will get a heavy, fast uh, GDP growth but investing in education is not as reliable. So the causality cannot be seen. So uh, what Kant said was that this thing in itself, the reality as it is, as it really is, as opposed to what it appears to be. So there are two things, how the reality appears to us, that's the phenomena, and what it is inside itself. So he said, thing in itself cannot be known, reality. So um, forget about that. And uh, uh, so he said that our knowledge will only be about models and about phenomena, our, our mind and ab appearances, not about reality. Get rid of that. So uh, Wittgenstein, another famous one, he said, do not talk about that which cannot be spoken of. So he said that the thing in itself, the reality, you cannot talk about it because you cannot know anything about it. But now, I cannot know anything about how you feel, but I can still talk about it. <laughs> and it's important and it's understandable. See, this is, the pro this is the thing. When I say that, you know, if I had only done this, then that would have happened. Uh, according to the positivists, this is a meaningless statement because it can never be observed. But everybody understands the meaning of it and uh, we can even assess whether or not it's true or false. That if I had studied harder, I would have passed the test, maybe. So, um, the Western philosophy of science rejects anything which is unobservable, like uh, the fact that I like apples in my heart. Now, this statement, this is the reality. So, um, but uh, Kant says that, no, don't talk about that because it's uh, unobservable. So you have to talk about something which is observable. So there are many, many philosophers. They came up with different ways to try to understand science. But like the blind man and the elephant, somebody said it's a spear, somebody says it's a rope, somebody says it's a wall. But nobody got the big picture that it's really an elephant. Oh, transcendental logic. Actually, you see, Kant uh, said, yani Kant understood something which later philosophers did not. He said that there has to be some reality, otherwise the phenomena cannot be understood. But at the same time, he said that we cannot access the reality. So what is the solution? He found the solution inside structures of the mind. He says that our mind recre recreates the reality. And so causality is inside uh, my mind. So this was another theory. Later on people rejected his theory. but uh, So he, he understood the problem and he tried to solve it. But uh, he could not come up with the solution. He still kept the reality and the observable uh, separate. So Kuhn said that all the previous philosophy of science is wrong and there are revolutions. And... Uh, uh, all of these are very complicated and difficult theories to understand uh, of something which is really very simple. But now science really can be understood by three-year-olds and uh, the reality and uh, so the, the, all of this complicated philosophy of science is just garbage. Uh, and there are lots and lots of books of garbage. So there is a very nice story which um, by Sir Walter Scott Ivanhoe in which there is this meeting between Salahuddin Ayubi and Richard the Lionheart. It never actually happened, but this is fiction. So they have a trial of strength. So uh, Richard the Lionheart uh, says, okay, bring me a big rock. So they bring him a big rock. He takes a hammer and he goes, bum, and the big rock breaks apart. So then Salahuddin Ayubi, 
he takes a silk scarf and he throws it up into the air and then he slices it with a knife and it parts into seven segments. So this is the difference. The one is brute force and no subtlety, no understanding and the other... So basically the West is stuck with a binary logic. If you say something, it's either true or it's false. Either you are with us or you are against us. Now, in Islam, there are lots of paradoxes, things which are both true and not true. And um, comes from the beginning that uh, one party of the Sahaba came to the Prophet and uh, uh, he had ordered them that you have to make Salatul Asr when you Maghrib when you get to the destination. So now uh, one party said that uh, uh, they, they became delayed in the, in the journey. Well, one party said that, you know, the time for Maghrib is going and so we must make Maghrib. Uh, the Prophet uh, had told us this because he had assumed that we would be there in time and he didn't know that we would get delayed. The other party said, no, he said that we have to make Maghrib when we're there and that's all and I'm not going to make any. So one party made Maghrib in the journey and the other party made Maghrib when they reached it. Then they, when they got back and they asked that who, who are, did right? So, so he said that both of you did right. So this uh, idea that that's why we have in Islam four different mazhab and they all say, okay, okay either uh, this is also right and this is also right even though they are saying opposite things. So this idea that we can have multi-valued logic where something can be true and false at the same time and it's every day. I mean, this is, this is what human logic is. Uh, if uh, one person says that um, he's big, uh, he's, uh, this house is big relative to a small house, but it is small relative to a big house. So it is true at the same time that this is a big house and it's also true at the same time it's a small house. So there are many, many all of our life uh, we are dealing with statements which are both true and false. So, um, this, uh, some people have started to talk about multi-valued logics, but nobody any in the West, I mean, people have discovered all of the true things, but nobody listens to them. This is the problem because they are far from the mainstream. So, I was reading recently about some philosopher who says for 20 years we have been studying and trying to uh, explain multi-valued logic where something can have be true or false or both true and false or neither true nor false but nobody understands but now people are beginning to listen so my little baby three year old Maryam she was trying to help uh, her aunt to put the baby to sleep babu so so the um, Auntie decided that it would be better to get rid of her. So she said, Mariam, I think your mother is calling you. So Mariam runs uh, away and she goes to the drawing room and she says that mother is engaged in conversation with somebody else deeply and doesn't even pay attention to Mariam. So she puts two and two together <laughs> and she started screaming, Mami ne bhagad ya, Mami ne bhagad ya. <laughs> so, so this is science. You see, there is the appearance, there is the nominal, that okay, I'm, my mother is calling. And then you examine, you look at the uh, uh, circumstances and you deduce that this appearance does not match this model of reality. And so you uh, modify the model. You say that no, uh, that was wrong. And then now you have to see through the appearance to the reality. So what's the alternate hypothesis? Now, why did, you know, it's obvious that mother didn't call me. So now that's not enough. I mean, the appearance. Of my, why did now you have to think about the hidden reality? What is this secret reality? Why did mommy say that uh, my, my mother is calling you? Oh, she wanted to. I'm a naughty child, and people are constantly sending me away for some reason. So she is trying to get rid of me. So <laughs> this is the thing that. But why shouldn't she? Didn't she just say go away because that would have hurt me? I'm a sensitive child, and I was trying to help with the, putting the baby to sleep. <laughs> So, this is what science is. You have look at the observation and then you look at the reality and then you construct a model. You see, this is your mental model. There are three things. You have to think three things at the same time. People who are only uh, able to think binary logic, true, false, they cannot think about three things at the same time. So, 
they've got two things, the phenomenal, the observation, and the mental model. The mental model is the theory which you have all studied. This is what you have been studying, the models. That is the uh, mental model. But how it matches to reality, that is completely missing. And that is what makes a model good or bad. And this is what Keynes understood. And this is what modern economists still do not understand. This is why we are running regressions all the time. Now you run a regression of FDI on GNP, that's fine. Now go and check it against the world to see if it's correct. You have found a pattern in the data. Does this pattern hold in the real world? That is the test. And nobody ever teaches that because the methodology is wrong. And though I've been trying to teach my team, go and look at the world. What happens to FDI? Who's coming in? Who's doing what, what exports? What is, I mean, unless you study the real world, you cannot find out the truth. And this is so obvious that any three-year-old can understand it. So there are three misunderstandings. If you want to make it formal, if you want to look at the philosophy, there are three misunderstandings which are explicitly written in the textbooks. One is, what is the scientific method? It is, search if, it is search for patterns in observations. This is false. It is not, science is not about searching for patterns. And what is a scientific law? A scientific law is a pattern that you find. I mean, you search, that is the method. If you find a pattern, that is the law. And that is your regression model. Again, this is not true. And so, if, how do you know if pattern is true or false? Well, there is no truth here. It's just if pattern continues, that's forecasting, that's prediction. So then, that is how you test, even though that's not the test of science. Forecasting is not the test, even though this is what you are taught. And what is explanation? I mean, I want to give a scientific explanation of something. So basically, this is called, uh, and if some, an event fits, in, I've seen a pattern, and this event fits the pattern, then that is explanation. Again, this is a wrong understanding of explanation. And actually, people realize that this is a stupid thing to do uh, and there is this famous uh, uh, joke about this model of explanation which is the current model being followed. Uh, a French uh, dramatist uh, said that, look, uh, why does opium put people to sleep? So they said it's because it has virtus dormita, it has the sleep inducing property. So how do we know it has this sleep inducing property because it puts people to sleep. <laughs> so basically you observe a pattern, you give people opium and it puts them to sleep. So you say, okay, here's the pattern and now if, if we test its forecast, then uh, we give it a new person and it puts it to sleep, then that's proof of the law. Now this is a complete misunderstanding because actually science is about how does it happen? I mean, what is it, what is contained, what is the chemical in opium, what is the uh, mechanism of sleep inside the body. So this idea that science is about patterns is wrong. But this is what economists believe. So, as opposed to this, the truth about science, the realist science, which is actually understood by a very small minority, that there are patterns, so patterns are important. This is one part of the elephant, the induction. Patterns is, is not uh, the but the patterns exist because of some underlying uh, force which is creating these patterns. If you have a, ma if you throw some filings, iron filings on, on a glass, they will not show any pattern. But if you put a magnet underneath, it will create a pattern. So there is something underneath which is creating the pattern. So now mm -hmm. the pattern is a clue to the hidden reality. So use that pattern to think what could be creating that pattern. We have we see this flux, and then we think about. What are the laws that could create this flock? So we make a guess. We may get guess that maybe birds try to align with the other birds. Maybe they try to move towards the center. And maybe they are trying to avoid each other uh, in collisions. So this is, uh, so we, we use the pattern, this is the induction of Bacon, to make a guess about the real world. This is the part that Bacon didn't understand. Uh, then a law is a guess about the hidden uh, underlying cause, like the apple falls to the ground, so the underlying cause is gravity. Now this is very strange, gravity doesn't, uh, is not there in the observables. It is something that you guess, it's a model, it's in your, inside your mind, but your model 
uh, and then once you make the mathematical model, then you can make calculation. This is inside. This is the analytical truth inside your model, but it doesn't need to match the real world. The, the two have to be kept separate. You have to separate your mental model from the reality. Our mental model is a guess about reality, and uh, the reality is the reality. So that is a law. A scientific law is something about unobservable things and unobservable causes like the force of gravity is an unobservable uh, cause and uh, electrons and photons these are unobservable entities god angels these are all unobservable entities uh, many others so what is an explanation explanation means that you take the surface phenomena and you break it down into the reality and then when you look at the and then you use the reality to explain um, so uh, basically for example cigarettes cause cancer this is an observation but how do they cause cancer well there are some smoke which causes some damage to the lungs so if the lungs are damaged then this will lead to cancer so that is the hidden part and he doesn't any what's observed is that you are smoking and then you can observe cancer but the hidden part is the mediation through the lungs so that is the sciences goes through the hidden reality so explanation is not fitting into a pattern so explanation about opium causing sleep is not because it always causes sleep that's what we see is because you find that there is some chemical inside opium and whenever you give that chemical whether it's in opium or not it causes sleep so that's more one step more towards the explanation because chemical is hidden but there's more i mean explanation involves any yani, more mechanism physiological me mechanism inside the body etc so the first step in uh, learning about the real world is to look at the real world so if we want to build consumer theory then we have to look at how consumers behave and actually we all have lots of experiences so we use our experiences to think what is a model that can be used to explain consumer behavior um, and the goal is to discover the hidden realities why did mommy sent me away so this is the hidden reality that you you make a guess about you conjecture you can never be sure maybe mommy was doing something else so keynes looked at the theory and he looked at the world he said there is no match and actually in the beginning of the book he says that you know the theories that i am making are not difficult the greatest difficulty was getting rid of the of the assumptions that i had been force fed by the wrong economic theories and the same thing is true you can make fast progress in discovering real world economics and inventing it because nobody knows these things that i am teaching you even though every 3 year old understands them so keynes looked at the world and he said that look the i see that the laborers went on strike when the uh, railroad uh, firm said that i'm going to cut wages 10% but uh, inflation by 10% occurred and they didn't go on strike so the conclusion is that laborers are not concerned about real wage and he says later that well this is too strong laborers are concerned about real wage if the inflation keeps going on and their power purchasing power keeps declining they will make up a, a representation and they'll go and they will complain and they will try to get their wages and and this has happened and we have seen it that okay inflation is high we should increase our wages but this is a different thing from uh wage cut so these two are different so there is a range of real wages they are willing to accept nominal wage is different so their reaction to the nominal wage is different from their reaction to they they worry about both things but in in different ways but uh, this again means that money enters the model because it's not only the real wage that matters the nominal wage so he actually explains it that the nominal wage negotiations are about relative wages people don't want to lose wages relative to others now the thing is that 
currently the real business cycle model rbc which is the dominant model on which the dsge model is built is built on the assumption that all things are real there is no money and so laborers can respond only to real wages so this fundamental insight of keynes is conflicting with aqida and therefore it is neglected so this is exactly the blind man and the elephant they cannot see the reality so so no existing macro model this is something very strange i mean somebody or the other should have come up with this sense to follow keynes i mean it's not even that we are telling this something from mars or something from the east or something from the quran and hadith no this is keynes their own celebrated uh, economist he said he told it to them but they still couldn't understand it so now so the process of modeling is a little bit subtle it's like the silk scarf and the sword it's not just brute to force on the stone because when you have a model you can never compare it with reality this is the correct insight of kant that reality is not directly accessible i can't say that okay i i my theory says that there are electrons so let's look at and try to find electrons because electrons are unobservables so then what you do is you compare the predictions of your theory with the predictions of a reality in which there would be electrons so i say okay i i know that there are beliefs actually i know that people have beliefs i know that people have preferences and so if i if she has preferences for bananas what would happen well uh, then if i give her a, a banana and apple she will take the apple so if she takes the apple then this is proof that my theory about the hidden reality is true it's more complicated than just uh, taking that this is all that is that the choice of the banana is the only reality this is what the mistake of samuelson is that when she chooses them this is all that this is what it means this there is no more to preference than the choice no there is more the choice was made because of the preference the preference if the preference had not been there the choice would not be made <coughs> so the choice and preference cannot be separated but the idea that you take only the observance and you, and you get rid of the reality this is a mistake <coughs> so because so ultimately that means that you can never be sure about your model so and you can never be sure about rejection of a model so that's what kane starts with he say okay here's our classical model of supply and demand and here's an observation in voluntary unemployment can this model and this observation be reconciled so this is the question that i asked you last in the quiz how can you can does involuntary unemployment conflict with Uh, supply and demand yes it does involuntary unemployment proves that the standard theory of supply and demand is wrong this is an observation uh, the theory of supply and demand does not support this observation so what are the explanation keynes goes through you know because you see unlike this this is the thing that when you reject a model the rejection is always subtle it's like it's not like smashing the stone it's like cutting the silk scarf because uh, so you look at what the model implies and then you look at the real world and you say there is a mismatch and then you say is it possible for the theory to explain this so suppose you have employment um, so basically keynes goes through four possibilities about how the classical model uh, can be reconciled with observations so one of the things is frictional unemployment so if there is a lot of friction which means that people are uh not able to find jobs then that can cause uh unemployment so keynes uh says that no there was not much change in the market structure see if there is uh some change which uh is improves the ability of people to find jobs or there is some change which makes it more difficult for people to search for jobs then that would lead to an increase in employment due to friction but uh basically um as i have told you earlier 
Keynesian theories are quite damaging to the capitalist, the wealthy capitalists. So there was a concerted effort to bury Keynesian theories. And um, my paper, my short uh, newspaper article on ideological economics and increasing inequality explains this in detail. But in 2010, there was the Nobel Prize given. Now, the Nobel Prize itself is a deception. It is actually the Riksbank Prize. They, they named the Riksbank Prize, the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences, in memory of Alfred Nobel. So, I can invent a, a prize and I can say, okay, this is my prize to you, Uzma, in memory of Alfred Nobel. So, uh, this, is, this is what they did. There is no relation to Nobel. I can say, okay, Uzma, we are going to Sweden, I will give you the prize over there. <laughs> so, now, if the newspapers think that uh, this is the Nobel Prize, then it will be, and it is called the Nobel Prize, even though it is not a Nobel Prize. But this was, actually, the theories of Keynes were very harmful to the financial institutions. He actually said once, at one point, that we should... Um, Get, kill, uh, get interest rate to zero and kill the financial pi parasites, uh, which are the banks. So they were uh, very opposed to this. So they created this bank and then they started giving Nobel Prize one after another to the Sh Chicago School, which, as I told you at the time of my graduate school, they were considered crackpots. But once they started winning so many Nobel Prizes, then they started becoming the orthodoxy. So, this Nobel Prize was given to Diamond Mortison and Pisarides. And what was this uh, Nobel Prize about? It was about search theory, which is basically a fancy word for frictional unemployment. So, basically what they said was that unemployment is frictional. And uh, this was already been rejected by Keynes, that this is not the main reason for unemployment. But So Keynes examines other possibilities that if there is a decrease in marginal productivity labor, then employment will go down. He says there's no there's been no change in the marginal productivity of labor. If there is an increase in the price of consumer goods, real wage will go down. So he says that's not true. If the laborers suddenly become lazy, they don't want to work, then the marginal disability of in labor will increase and unemployment. So he says none of the th none of the explanations that can come from classical model can explain the observations. So there is a mismatch between the model and the observations. Not a mismatch between observations and reality. Sorry, not m models and reality. So we need to make a new model. That's that's the thing because this model cannot match whatever reality. We don't know what the reality is, but this model does not match it. So this is one more thing that was said that, well, labor unions prevent people from accepting low wages, otherwise the wages would go down. That's the prediction of economic theory. You don't see real wages go down. So why? Well, because the labor unions are very strong and they are preventing cuts in wages. He says, you know, in a, uh, in a large scale unemployment, this doesn't happen. People are not uh, obstinate. People are aware that so many jobless people, so they, they say, okay, we'll take whatever you can give. So basically Keynes said that the real wage is an emergent property of the system. Um, this is a quote from him. Traditional theory maintains that wage bargains between entrepreneurs and workers determine the real wage. It's determined at the uh, part level, at, not at the system level. But he says that it's not true. The real wage is determined at the system level. The bargains between the entrepreneurs and workers determine the nominal wages, not the real wage. So, um, basically the ISLM model and nearly all understanding of what Keynes was saying are based on uh, misunderstanding Keynes. One of them was that if wage prices are fixed in the sh short run, then basically the real wage cannot adjust in the short run. So, basically Keynes is associated with sticky wages. And actually Keynes did talk about sticky wages early in his uh, career, but in his book General Employment, he rejects sticky wages. He says wages and prices are flexible, but even if they are flexible, they, uh, the real wage will not 
will not uh, adjust to the equilibrium. And the other thing was, Cain said, uh, uh, was a misunderstanding of Cain was that there is money illusion. So you see what Cain says is that uh, wages uh, work with nominal wages. So the, the theory says that no, it must be real wage. So he says, okay, instead of f f adjusting the theory, we say that workers are irrational. Uh, and so workers have illusion. They, they, when the money wages goes up, they think the real wage has gone up, even though uh, if the prices have gone up, it has not. This is not what Keynes was saying, and this is not the reality. And this is not, now I would like to invoke yani your personal experience, one, something which you have never been trained to do. If you just think about how people behave, uh, and that is the golden test, how people behave. And then you can easily understand without my explaining to like like a three year old why people will strike if I say that okay I'm going to cut the salaries of everybody at pi by 50% tomorrow uh, people will go on strike and they will be chalegi uh, nahi chalegi kya hoga kya hoga strikes and banners and protests and zulm ke faisle uh, on the other hand, if the prices double tomorrow, there will be no strike. Uh, but they will, people will come and say, please uh, help us, we are having problems with paying our bills. But that, uh, that's different. So it's not the real wage. Uh, so people don't have money illusion. This is, this is a wrong. And people do understand real wage. People do understand purchasing power. But it's just not... This is not how real world people behave. So the theory is wrong. But unfortunately, this is, theory is sacred cow. It cannot be touched. So once you believe in that theory, then the world doesn't make any sense. And so you say, okay, let's ignore reality. Sir, what about that liquidity trap of Pain? That's a difficult dis uh, discussion. It's yeah. complicated about money. We will get to that, inshallah, later. <coughs> so, my paper and Sayyid uh, Kamar uh, Abbas, uh, we just looked at empirical evidence against the supply and demand model. So, one of these is involuntary unemployment. This is the one that Keynes gave. The other one was that the uh, re uh, asymmetric reaction to increase in nominal wage and uh, sorry, uh, change, uh, to to real wage uh, to to price and to uh, wage. And then there is more. This debate has been going on for a long time, and so there are more evidence which has come up for to support Keynes that the supply and demand model does not work in the labor market. The strange thing is that the supply and demand is such a holy cow of the. Uh, economists that they never mention this. They are teaching you in your Keynesian courses that supply and demand doesn't work, but they never mention it. That here is a, uh, even though you are teaching, being taught supply and demand in other courses, you are not taught that here we have a problem with supply and demand because in labor market doesn't work. Even though if they teach the Keynesian theory, <coughs> it's automatically that full employment of labor does not occur. Now why doesn't full employment occur? Because Supply and demand theory doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? They don't explain it. <coughs> and they never make it clear. So there are lots of confusions that uh, arise in economic theory. <coughs> because economists are a very confused bunch of people. And that's what Keynes said, that if, con if economists could just be like dentists, that when you have a pain in your tooth, you go and they fix it, and you're reliable. The economists are not as reliable as dentists. <laughs> And so he said, this is my ambition for economists, that one day they will achieve this status of being reliable. But unfortunately, they did not live up to his expectations. So one of the major uh, evidences that comes up against the supply and demand for labor is that there are wage differentials across industries. And in this paper, we study the wage differential in Pakistan, and we find that in the textile industry, uh, other industries, they seem to have the same wage. But in, text, in textile industry, the wage is a little bit higher. 
than the others. And uh, we can examine it in others. The point is that if you have an unskilled laborer, then um, the labor market is the same. He should be able to find the same wage in any industry uh, according to the level supply and demand. But this doesn't happen. In some industries, the same person will get a higher wage. And I'm not talking about one person. <laughs> that, one, that can happen as an exception. I'm talking about the average wage in a given industry for all people. So that cannot be systematically higher than the average wage. According to the classical theory of supply and demand, what will happen if, for example, textiles is paying everybody 100 rupees an hour and the cement industry is paying everybody 50 rupees an hour? What will happen? Will yes, people will go to the textile industry, so the supply will increase, the wage will go down, and the, so this is the mechanism. Beautiful mental model. Now, is this how the way the reality works? This is the thing that you have been trained not to look at reality. Kant said, don't look at it. Now, Wittgenstein said, don't talk about that which you cannot talk about. But we have eyes. We can see what will, hap what will really happen is that there will be excess uh, supply. People will be keep applying for jobs, but nobody will get them. And there will be big lines. And uh, in the other industry, there will be less line, but you will have... So this is this is what the we have we have seen with our own eyes. So we don't need to uh, study the theories which are against this. Now, basically, the study of economics systematically cripples people, systematically makes them blind to reality. Uh, this was best demonstrated by the ultimatum game, in which uh, you take a pile of money, like a hundred rupees. I've done this in many classes. And I give it to students and I say, okay, uh, this half of the class. Now, this side of the class is the decider and the other side is the, uh, you are the proposer and you are the, um, you have to accept or reject. So, uh, now I will ask, uh, what is your name? Aisha. Aisha. Okay, Aisha. You have to offer them a proposal that I will, we will keep so much and you can have that much. You can, uh, you can discuss with your <laughs> classmates as to what you want to offer them. And then they get to decide yes or no. That's the only thing they get to say. So for example, you can say, we will keep 900 and you get 100. And they get to say yes or no. That's all they say. If they say yes, then it is according to your decision. And if they say no, then I get back my 1000 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the ultimatum game. So what do you say? Naini, first, uh, you don't get to say anything. You only have, you decide among yourself. They, they, they accept. They accept, okay. Now, you see, according to economic theory, you can have chocolates with this afterwards. Um, according to the economic theory, they should have offered nine, uh, kept 900 and 100, because your yes, no, it is a choice between 100 and 0. But what would have happened if they had offered 900, to 900 for us and 100 for you? Maybe because of survival for coexistence, if um, they are maybe uh, scared of us, they, if they will go out of the class and we can ask. <laughs> 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 okay. The, that, uh, our, uh, the thing is, you see, what I wanted to say is that what the econ uh, everybody understands, everybody in the real world, three-year-old babies, understand that we should make fair offers. Economists do not understand. According to economic theory, it should be 900, 100 offer and they should accept. And when experiment after experiment after experiment proved that this was wrong, this is not how real world people behave, then the economists uh, became very puzzled. And they, don't, they said that our theory is not working. There's, um, and still they don't understand. It, it doesn't follow utility maximization. But because they have aqidah in utility maximization, they don't understand how the ultimatum game theorem works. So, basically, there is a large amount of evidence that the supply and demand model is wrong. There are wage differentials. This is one of the big evidences. So, why they are there? And then there is the... Um, um, 
uh, there, there's this second piece of evidence with somebody else. You see, this, this is science. Now, suppose that there is a large pool of involuntary unemployed laborers. This is what is usually the case. You have large unemployment. Lots of people want jobs. They don't have, and, and jobs are not there. So what will happen? Well, supposedly, what will happen is that the real wage should start to try to come down. But uh, there should be no effect on productivity. But actually, what you, when you look at the real world, the reverse is true. There is no pressure on real wages. Real wages remain same. But what happens is that the productivity increases. Why? Why does the productivity increase? Now, this is a question about finding out why the mommy said. It's a hidden reality. Suppose there is a large pool of unemployed laborers. Why will productivity at PIDE increase? Exactly. Because people are afraid to lose jobs because there's somebody ready to uh, replace you. So it's not the real wage. The competition does not occur that the person will come in and say, I will offer to work. You are working at uh, 14,000. I will come in and work at 13,000. No, that's not. But you are afraid that there's lots of people like me. And if I work, if I'm lazy, I get fired. People will come in and replace me and everybody will be happier. So... You work harder so as to not get fired. So, this is exactly the opposite of what the supply and demand model says. And every child can understand it. So, economic theory is actually very easy if you, think, if you use your minds. But if you put on your helmets and, and blinders, which economic theory puts on you, by teaching you these idiotic things like Romer and dif differential equations and utility maximization, then it makes you, it makes you handicapped. You cannot understand economics. Sir, what about the different types of contracts and permanent jobs? The behavior of employees and employers. That is very complicated. Now, I, I, right now I'm take, teaching ABCs and you're talking about uh, very complex things. So basically, um, Keynes said that real wage is an emergent pho phenomena. The modern economists never understood what Keynes said. Uh, so then they, the new Keynesians came along and they asked this question, can we construct models in which the real wage is higher than the equilibrium wage? Now this is not the question which Keynes was asking. Uh, Keynes said that real wage has nothing to do <laughs> with this. The uh, negotiations about nominal wage. But uh, the new Keynesians wanted to construct a model in which laborers still work for the marginal disability, but equilibrium is above higher. So they're asking a different question. They want to, again, this is a, a, a problem with science that um, you can never be uh, sure. So maybe there is a theory in which laborers set real wage equal to marginal disutility and in which there is unemployment. We don't know yani, uh, because we don't have any access to the reality directly. But we have some ideas. I mean, we, we are not completely blind. We understand the world and so we can look for mechanisms which match to what is going on. And we know that people do not work according to the marginal disutility of labor. I, any, actually, you are young and you are students, so maybe you don't know very much. Because, But anybody who has a job and who has seen people with jobs, they know that it is not the real wage which is the... Any, the wage can go up and down by quite a bit and it will not change how people behave or work. Of course, if you reduce it a, a, a lot, then they might move the job or if you increase it a lot, that Actually, uh, people have actually studied this and shown that if you increase the wage uh, as a reward, it, uh, it has a transitory effect, has a short-term effect. People work harder for a little while, then they get used to this ne new level and they say, okay, this is what I deserve. And so they, it's a short-term stimulus. So basically, according to the managers, increasing wages is not a good strategy to get people to work harder. Because it only works for a short time and then you have to keep repeating and, and it causes all sorts of other problems. So, 
uh, instead, basically, what are the motivations for labor? This is a big theory, and uh, uh, and uh, one of the important findings of this theory is that money is not a big driver of motivation. People have curiosity, people have uh, um, uh, enthusiasm about service, they, they have causes, they have many, uh, money is, is one motivating factor, but it's a very small and minor motivating factor. So, in our paper, we are looking at efficiency wage theories. At that time, I wasn't uh, fully, um, I wasn't at this place in terms of knowledge. So I was uh, working along with the, I didn't realize actually that efficiency is wage is not what Keynes was working about. So efficiency wage is an attempt to get the uh, theory, the second axiom in, uh, so that people are working with real wages, but at the same time uh, to show that real wages is above the equilibrium wage. And so there is a permanent uh, unemployed labor. So one of the early hypotheses was the nutritional hypothesis. This is also called, this is also something which uh, Marx said, actually it comes from Marx, that basically uh, the laborer is always in excess. They are always large numbers and the need is always small. So basically you can hire uh, laborers at whatever wage you like. There will always be an excess supply. This is called the reserve army of the unemployed in Marxian terminology. So then what determines the wage? It's, if it's not the intersection of the supply and demand, it's the subsistence level. How much money does it take for the laborer to survive? If you give him less than that, he will die. So it's not worth it for him to work at that wage. Then he says, okay, if I'm going to die anyway, I might as well be free. And so uh, if you give him a wage which will enable him to live and maybe his family to live, then he will say, okay, that so then the wage is not determined by supply and demand, it's determined by the amount that it takes to uh, survive. Uh, then there is uh, these other hypotheses. All of these hypotheses are efficiency wage hypothesis. So nutritional hypothesis is not, uh, was rejected in uh, uh, like places like the Great Depression in Britain because there was a, a social service system in place. So people could get uh, subsistence level uh, income from the government and still there was unemployment. So this could not be the explanation. Uh, otherwise no one would work. So that would be different. So that's not the explanation. So there's adverse selection that uh, basically if you, um, when you are, uh, offer a low wage, uh, you see different people have different qualities and the high quality worker will only hire, f be available to hire for at a higher wage. So, but you can't tell the quality. So if you offer the equilibrium wage, only low quality wor worker will come up uh, to your job. If you are a wage higher than the going wage, then lots, you will get lots of people. Among these, there will be high quality people. And if you can discriminate, if you can pick out those who are good, you can hire high quality people by offering a wage bigger than the equilibrium wage. Then there is this gift exchange theory, which says that if I give my um, laborer a gift, he will pay back by working harder for me. So this is exactly in uh, the contract theory says that what I should do in order to get my worker to work harder is that if he works harder, I, I should give an incentive system, a bonus scheme. If you, if your productivity is high, I will pay you a reward. If your productivity is low, I will punish you. I will take uh, your uh, wage, will, your, your bonus will be reduced. Now, this is what the theory says, but the reality is exactly the opposite. And everybody with a three-year-old mind can understand this. That if I, and this is exactly what happens in reality. If you give an uh, incentive-based uh, contract that, okay, you produce more and I will, you'll get reward, then people try to cheat on that. And they try to get fulfill the the promise, like they, they say, okay, you are going, you want uh, one thousand goods produced. So I'll produce one thousand goods, but they will be very low quality. I'll just do it a quick job. And instead, if you say, okay, I'm going to give you a thousand rupees because I like you and I trust you and I, I trust you to do the best for me, 
that will uh, he will produce then uh, the best quality at the best and he will put in overtime because of my trust so this is the gift exchange model which is rather different so the economic model doesn't work even though this is the contract theory model it's it's completely false and anybody who applies it in reality discovers by ex bitter experience that this doesn't work <coughs> then there is this theory so again if there is gift exchange then people will pay more than the going wage if there is fair wages uh, this is the concept that uh, these are all possible so you see this is we are now working like a scientist there is a phenomena we see there is unemployment uh, we have rejected one model now we are trying to think what could be the reason why the why the wage is higher than the equivalent why lots of people are unemployed so i have given three explanation the fourth and and now how do we find out we find out by checking against reality not by doing math so fair wages this is another explanation which has these are all explanation which have been given by people who looked at the world and they found your your experience of the world is low so in order to learn more economics you have to learn more about you have to read more and get more experience you can't get more experience by i mean you can get more experience by living but that's a very limited way of getting experience so you get experience by reading by learning about uh, what other people who have studied the world have come up with so you study their findings but not by reading about regression models but by reading about reality so fair wages is another thing that people believe that there is a certain level of wage which is fair if, if a millionaire is making a lot of money from the factory and uh, every good is being sold for certain amount then the laborer thinks that in this factory so much money is being made so i should get so much and there is a certain level which he thinks is fair and if you give him too little um uh, every good is sold for 1000 uh, rupees but and thousands of goods are sold but he is getting only 1000 rupees he says well you know this is just not fair um then there is this shirking model in which people try to avoid work and the um people monitor them so the costs of monitoring are fairly high and um but if you monitor them sufficiently then you can um uh get them to work harder uh or you can pay them higher wages so anyway so basically then the re uh, the model is good if it matches reality uh, but you can never test for a direct match so that what makes life difficult so you te test the model with the uh, predictions of the model and uh so this is an indirect check and it can always be wrong because you don't have a direct match here yeah. electrons exist i looked and there is no electron so uh you say electrons exist it means that such and such phenomena will happen and such and such phenomena did not happen probably electrons did not exist but maybe something happened to prevent that phenomena from taking place and electrons are still there this is always possible and this is the thing which makes the emergence of philosophies like logical positivism possible because you can never 100% reject a theory about reality because there is no direct match uh, available so basically we have to engage the mind to find economic theory so far everything you have been told you have been told that cut off your brains and uh, cut off your experience and cut off your reality and just study the math and memorize the math and this is economics and this is a completely bogus and stupid and false and idiotic uh theory which is being taught all over the world to all the students poisoning their minds so you can invent a new theory and you can explain it to the world and this is your job try to go and explain to other students who have been poisoned that how you can make them see the light <coughs>